Hello all of you beautiful little demons, Jules here for WhatCulture.com, back again with another episode of the awesomely named and awfully hosted Choose Your Own Adventure, the weekly medieval theme format where I, the crown jewels of WhatCulture.com, take a list chosen by you, yes you the person who started off the week by replacing one door, then a lock broke on another door so I had to replace that, then another door had to be replaced as well. Three doors in one week, that's got to be some sort of record. Yes, you get to decide what list I dole out to you each and every week. And this week we have none other to thank than... Me. Now I know it's a bit uh, ironic that I would uh, create this community-focused uh, show and then decide to dole out ideas that I've generated, but trust me, there is one specific video game that I wanted, nay, needed, to talk about this week, and you'll understand why. So yes, today we're talking about times that video game nostalgia was exploited, but actually not for all the wrong reasons. Now using the term exploiting in a sentence really sets a good tone for the conversation, right? I mean, it's a word that is accepted by its implication that can mean that something or someone is manipulating a situation for their own benefit. It's also a term that has been bandied around a lot when it comes to the video game industry and with good reason, as it seems that developers and publishers the world over love nothing more than taking pleasant childhood memories and wheeling them out for their own personal game. For example, why don't we just take the, I don't know, the entire 1980s, which seems to be a huge source of fuel for the fire for video game publishers and developers, because they basically just grab mascots from the past and just say, hey, remember this guy? Remember this guy? Remember this guy? <laughs> we'll give us some money, or I'll hit him in the head. Sploink! <laughs> Of course you remember them, and simply by their sheer existence in their video game, publishers want you to take part in a rose-tinted transaction, no matter how shoehorned or forced the tie-in is. But that's not what we're talking about today, because we're actually going to be covering some cases of when nostalgia was still technically exploited, but actually came at the benefit of both the publisher and the player. Confused? Well, take a seat, my friend, and let's have a chat, and if you already sat down, then Sit down further, you fool, as I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are seven video games that tried to exploit nostalgia and won. Number seven, Retro Skins, Resident Evil 2 Remake and Metal Gear Solid Ground Zeroes. Oh boy, graphics will never get better than this. I remember saying that about Final Fantasy IX. Now, upon reflection, I was an absolute idiot, but at the time, I seriously thought that the likes of Zidane and his crew were the best realized and most beautiful looking sprites that I'd ever seen. Now, looking at the landscape of today, where even trackside flowers on kart racing games have more fidelity than the best looking moments of my childhood titles, it's almost brain breaking to think how graphics can improve further. And yet, I, alongside so many others, will always get a huge nostalgia boner whenever a developer offers us the chance to play a current gen game with classic skins. I honestly feel like bloody Ed Gein sometimes for how much I crave these nostalgic skins, and when the likes of Resident Evil 2 Remake and the almighty Metal Gear Solid Ground Zeroes offered us a chance to play in these low polygonal suits, then oh, you best believe I was there for that, son! It might seem like a small detail to many, but the fact that the devs chose to remind people of their title's lineage in a loving and rather humorous way shows a lot of thanks for the foundations built by these classic titles. Hell, in the case of Ground Zeroes, the PS1-inspired snakeskin suit also comes with a special mission that infused the gameplay with a supremely retro tone that sends shivers of ecstasy through my blocky bones. Oh, I love it! That's, I, I don't know how to represent physical blocks, all right? Work with me here. Number six, everything about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge. And here we come to the crux of this list immediately. Uh, the reason why I wanted to make this list is because James Dowes and I have played through this game recently. I did it for review on What Culture as well, and ye gods, is this a blast from the past, and I am strapped to the rocket, my friend. I love this game. Without a shred of hyperbole, I think it's one of the best arcade experiences I've ever had. Okay? All right? Good. This, in my opinion, is video game nostalgia done right. It is a carefully considered beautiful homage to the past that elevates not only the TMNTIP as a whole, but also delivers such a fun and exciting time that it actually stands as one of the finest side-scrolling brawlers ever. It's also a game that will have a vice-like grip on your dopamine receptors if you have even a shred of love for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Those pizza munching party pals. 
I mean, where to begin with this one? The graphics are a fantastic throwback to the arcade TMNT games, but are filled with so much character and subtle animations that it's clear that this is no low poly filter rush job. The soundtrack will slap your cheeks so hard that they will reveal your bloody skeleton, and the gameplay is so viscerally addictive and well produced that gamers of any skill level will be able to pick this right up and get right into the action. Plus, as an added moment of true nostalgia, this game doesn't break the bank. It's not a £70 plus title release that so many other sort of remasters, remakes and reimaginings are trying to con their way through the market with. This actually feels and gets a proper nostalgia pop from me for not breaking the bloody bank. I've got enough cash left after buying this for a curly whirly. Hell, I might even splash out for a chomp as well. A bloody chomp, James. Number five, taking Sonic back to his roots, Sonic Generations. Now, as we're all aware, Sonic as a video game mascot and an icon of the video game industry as a whole has had so many ups and downs that Simon Miller is personally suing him. Now, we've all visited the absolute doldrums that were Sonic 06 and the disaster piece that was Sonic Rise of Lyric. Ugh. But here's the thing. He can have an upshot sometimes. He can have a good day. Sometimes. And this made the glorious love letter that was Sonic Mania all the more special. This game was piano wired tight, looked utterly amazing, and sounded like if Jesus came back in chiptune format. However, it's not being included on this list. Why, I hear you ask? Well, it's because Sonic Team didn't actually make this game. Therefore, I don't think it should be included as a nostalgia pop because of the fact that the original developers didn't create it. It was created by the fans through nostalgia, yes, and is a moment of great nostalgic memories being formulated into one crystalline experience, but it didn't come from the original developers. That's not to say that they haven't tried their best though, because Sonic Generations came pretty damn close. Because yes, even though it sounds like I'm bashing on Sonic Team, I want to talk about Sonic Generations, a title that was produced by the assigned devs which actually hit that sweet nostalgia target by giving fans exactly what they've been crying out for for years, and that is a 2D Sonic. Sonic Generations traded heavily on letting fans go back to the good old days with 2D Sonic sections that even featured the retro design of everyone's favourite quick-stepping hedgehog. And as you'd expect, this gambit absolutely worked. Sales were much higher than previous 3D escapades and critical reception, especially of these sections, was through the roof. We asked, we got, we thanked Sonic Team for not including bestiality. Number four, the soundtrack of your youth. Tony Hawk's 1 and 2 Remaster. Now, I won't lie to you, when the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 Remaster came up for pre-order, I absolutely punched my screen as hard as I could trying to hammer home that pre-order button. I was just like, get in my basket. Not a touchscreen monitor, cost me a lot of money. The original trilogy of Tony Hawk's games was absolutely pivotal to my interest in gaming as a whole. And I know so many other gamers who list these titles as some of their favorite childhood games. And while Activision could have easily just slapped a high res texture pack on top and wheeled it out to make an absolute bundle, they did the unthinkable and actually set out to make a decent and loving remaster of the original two games. And in amongst all of the promises of reworked gameplay additions, such as the revert being added into the titles and online support, Support was a feature that filled many with that warm, gooey goodness of nostalgia. I'm speaking, of course, about the soundtrack, which arrived admittedly with a few omissions, but with enough force to still recapture the glory days of our youth. Nearly every single absolute smash banger was on the playlist once more, and it just transported you back to being a wee stupid little oik, holding the controller for the first time and doing like, I don't know, a 180 melon and thinking that that was the best trick you were ever going to land. It was a glorious experience. And you know what? Activision got a lot of positive feedback for actually going down, doubling down on this moment. They could have easily just grabbed in a ton of new art artists, and admittedly they did put in a few new tracks as well, but they could have just replaced the entire soundtrack and said, there you go. But the fact that they went back, back to the drawing board and said, let's actually give fans what they want rather than what we tell them what they want. And you know what? That was a good thing for all involved. Number three, Lego DLC, Forza Horizon 4 Lego Speed Champions. Now I'll ask you, James, is there anything more nostalgic than Lego? Yes, Hot Wheels. 
No, I'll answer for you, actually. That, no, no. Yeah, but Forza Horizon 3 had Hot Wheels. You Lego. Lego is the answer that I was looking for. Some of the earliest memories of your childhood may well be block-based thanks to this wonderful construction and creativity-based toy. Is it, is it a toy? Is a brick a toy? Are we telling kids that bricks are toys now? Yes. And I know of a fair few adults with more than their fair share of Lego sets adorning their walls and shelves. The love for Lego has only grown as the brand has expanded into more and more complex sets and tied itself to almost every IP going, meaning that there is quite literally something for everyone to enjoy. And while the Lego brand has sometimes churned out a few stinkers in its time, the likes of Lego Star Wars and Lego Marvel superheroes really do stand out as not being just great games, but also massive dollops of nostalgia for fans of the medium. However, one of the low-key best LEGO bangers ever actually comes in the form of a racing game, and no, unfortunately, I'm not going to be talking about LEGO racers today. I will cover that on a list at some point in time, but today we're talking about Forza Horizon 4 which got a Lego-based expansion. And it is an absolute stonker. Tearing through Lego playsets at speed is just so much fun that I swear the government will likely ban it at some point. And being able to build your own house is just the icing on the blocky cake. A pseudo-realistic race simulator, and Lego should not mix this well, but it forms a sweet and heady broth that you'll be quaffing for weeks to come. Number two, FOMO Mario, Super Mario 3D All-Stars. And now we turn to the curious case of Super Mario 3D All-Stars, a trilogy of Mario's best games that dropped for the Switch in 2020, only to then drop off the face of the bloody earth a few months later. While other entries on this list have been cases of publishers putting players first, this was a case of appearing to be a gesture of goodwill that turned into a greasy marketing tactic by Nintendo. Now, it's fair to say that a lot of Ninty fans are incredibly nostalgic for Mario's early 3D outings, with many touting these games as being the benchmark to which all others are measured even to this day. And so they were incredibly excited when the 3D All-Stars pack was announced for the Switch and included Mario 64, Mario Sunshine, and Mario Galaxy. The fact that this was also announced alongside Nintendo's 35th Mario Celebration event made the nostalgia hit all that harder. So of course, many bought in straight away for the simple fact that this was their childhood, but now on a handheld console. And yet, for Nintendo, this apparently wasn't enough. To drive home the fact that you needed to buy this pack, Nintendo Nintendo announced that after a few months, this bundle would be delisted from online sites and that they wouldn't print any more physical copies. This was now a slice of nostalgia with a deadline. A rather insidious move indeed to effectively hold your childhood to ransom, but at the end of the day, people bought this in droves, so technically Nintendo exploited our nostalgia and most definitely won here. And number one, all of the nostalgia, Mortal Kombat 11. So when it came to answering the question of, hmm, I wonder what part of the collective consciousness we should mine for that sweet, sweet nectar of money, NetherRealm Studio answered with everything, every last drop of it. I want it all. Now this might seem like hyperbole, but seriously, just take a look at the DLC characters for the Mortal Kombat franchise and try and tell me that your inner child isn't experiencing a sugar rush unlike anything else. Rambo, the Terminator, freaking Robocop, joined the roster of Stone Cold Killers in Mortal Kombat 11 in a manner that screams, just remember these guys? And continues a rather epic trend of the studio pumping fans full of fizzy nostalgia pop, what with their previous efforts including the Xenomorph, Leatherface, and the Predator. It seems Seems like any movie IP worth a damn has been well and truly mined, as have the wallets of fans who were more than willing to splash the gore-soaked cash. But what separates these characters from other Tesco brand tie-ins is the fact that it actually kind of fit with the tones of their respective IPs. I mean, splitting throats, smashing heads, and then covering their skeletons in acid blood or spit is actually very on brand with a lot of these, well, other brands. So yeah, it fits so well, and that's why people were really, really keen to kill with Robocop. Yay. And there we go, my friends. Those were seven video games that tried to exploit nostalgia and won. I hope that you enjoyed that, and please let me know what you thought about it down in the comment section below. As always, I've been Jules. You can go follow me over on Twitter at RetroJ, but the O is a zero, and the same for Instagram. RetroJ, but the O is a zero. Hope that you enjoyed that. Hope that you're doing well. Hope that you treat yourself with love and respect, my friend, because at the end of the day, I've got a lot of nostalgic love for you guys. You got me here at this point 
point on the channel with all the love and support. So I'm always going to pay it back to you. I hope that you're treating yourself with love and respect. I hope that you realize that you are a massive legend. You deserve all of the best things in life. And I hope more than anything else that you go out today and you smash your life goals. I believe in you and thank you very much. As always, I've been Jules. You have been awesome. Never forget that. I'll speak to you soon. Bye. <laughs>